One day, one day it'll be here, Bunky. <laughs> morning, everyone. Welcome to Sun Valley Church of Christ, Sunday morning, Bible study. Glad you're with us this morning. We are in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. Um, looked at some things that uh, are worth review, looking at again to make sure we get, uh, you know, get a foundation underneath us of what Paul's talking about. Ephesians is a wonderful book, um, written to, I think somebody said it was written to us. Well, true, I guess. It relates to us, but it wasn't written to us. It was written to the church in Ephesus, right? Which we glean the benefits of that, but yeah, but actually it was written to uh, the church in uh, the congregation or the church in, in Ephesus. So yeah, we get to glean from it. And we're gleaning very well as we're getting through chapter 4. Um, we looked at that God's grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. God gave the gifts to the church. To why? Why did He do that? Why did Why did He give gifts to the church? To establish the church, have to get the ball rolling, right? Because they didn't really have anything except the Old Testament um, to get the ball rolling. So the New Testament was being lived out and written out. So. They didn't have anything to look back on or to learn from except for what the apostles uh, were teaching. And to get those apostles' credibility, if you will, they needed to show that they were from God. And what did Nicodemus tell Jesus at midnight or so when he went in and met with him, right? What, what, what was his point? What, what, how did he start out? Well, we know what? We know you're from God. How? By the works, yes, by your works. We know you're from God. So that, that's the idea. That, that's what we're getting from this. The gifts were given to the church so the people would say, we know this from God. This man barks at, the nat at, the, at, at nature and it, and it calms down. He calms the seas. He heals people. This is all from God. So what he and his apostles are doing must be real, must be from God. Okay? Now, that ain't given to us today. How do we show people we're from God? What is it? By example, okay, very good. Example of what? John chapter 13. By this, they will know you are my disciples. Okay, the oneness, the unity. I'm glad you brought that up because we're going to be talking about that from the pulpit this morning. Philippians chapter 2. Um, but it's, for, uh, John 13, he talks about love. By this love, they will know you're my disciples, and the unity's in that love, right? The example's in that love. That's who we are. And it's, is, it, is it love for the world? What is it? It's not love for the world that's going to show us where we're from. What, the, what, what is it? Your love? Love for God and love for your man. Love, yeah, love for one another. Love for, one, for the church. Folks, we've got to understand that. My love for you is different than my love for the world. Just like I love y'all, but my love for my wife is a different love. It's, it's different. Our love for each other, it has to show a unity. You know, my love for, for you is if Mike would go out and do something bad against me, I'm not going to run over to Colin and badmouth him and rock his boat because of what he did to me. I'm going to sit down and talk, and we're going to work this out because that's the kind of love that God has set his church upon. And so we get to, we get to show that love. We get to be that example, if you will. We get to show that unity that only that kind of love can bring. Mm. <coughs> Point. That's the one we're looking for. That's the oneness that we're looking for. And to get that, we go to the book of Philippians to get our spiritual psychology lined up. And we're going to look at that today out of Philippians chapter 2. 
And we're going, to, we're going to grow in our understanding. Our love for God grows. Why? What, why is that important? Paul prayed that in Philippians chapter 1. Our love. That, that Everything's about love, people. It's not about hate. It's not about anger. It's not about revenge. It's not about for self-glory. It's about love. If, if it's about anything else, throw it out. You know, I'm teaching this class because I love. Not because I'm getting paid. Oh, am I getting paid, Jimmy? Do you know? We do what we do because we love. You know? What makes, what makes a couple go into a house that they've never been in that's full of cigarette smoke, empty beer cans, and goats jumping all over the couches? What causes people to do that? Love. You know? And that's experience talking. We did that. You know? And <laughs> I don't mention the mouse that the little girl come up and put on Tina's shoulder and flipped her out. But yeah, we, and we stayed. We didn't get up and leave. We did it because we love. That's the idea of the church. We love. But love is different. I love the world different than I love you. You know, I would do anything to bring the word to the world but I will not enable the world to live in sin. You see, my love for you is, is different that, you know, like Jesus said, we lay down our lives for each other. We think of you as more important than me. Your needs are more important than anything else I got going on in this world, even above my own interests. You know, you know, some Monday night, if Denver were to play football again, you caught that, didn't you? <laughs> and, and I get to go watch him, but Rusty said, Cub, I need you to come over and help me fix this, this rig so I can go out next Friday. Well, I would, Broncos, I'll see you later. I got to go, well, please don't hold me to that. No. <laughs> no, but that's what I'm saying. The interest of others is more important than my own interest. Okay? And that's what, that's what makes the church strong, you know? And even if you do something wrong to me, I'm not going to hate you. I'm not going to talk bad about you. I'm not going to run you down. I'm going to go to you. We're going to sit down and talk. We're going to hug it out. And we're going we're to fix it. So this love can continue. And that's, that's what the church is about. That's what Paul was reminding the Ephesians, you know? I know you live in Ephesus, but you're Christians. You got a different lifestyle ahead of you. You got a different platform ahead of you. The purpose Christ gave, three reasons, equipping of the saints. He wants us to go out and be equipped to go do the work. So these gifts were given to these people to help them to go out and show the world that they're from God for the work of the service, right? For the work of service. Uh-oh, there's that four-letter cuss word, work. Nobody likes to do that. You know, uh, a couple, a few people did a lot of work last night. and put something together that was really, really cool. We got together as families and did stuff together as families and enjoyed it and had a blast. And I thank everyone who, you know, did some work and helped with that. It was, it was awesome. I appreciate it very much. But that's what it, it's work. It's work. Yeah, I know. That's a cuss word. But, you know, if you enjoy doing it, it's never work, right? And we should enjoy doing these things. And that's why the gifts were given for the work and to the building up of the body of Christ. And that word building up that Paul used is like building a house. We are building God's house. Everything we do, everything we say, everything we think is a nail, is a board, is paint, whatever it is to take to build the house. And you gotta, you gotta, and you gotta be honest with yourself. Is what I'm doing building a house or tearing it down? See, because God's in the building department. The devil's in the demo. He likes to destroy things we are in the building the building up and that's what the gifts were given for so that can take place so what are the goals of these gifts that christ gave us well verse 13 let's look at that start in verse 13 today we'll read 13 through 16 um in verse 11 he says gave some as apostles there's a the gift some as prophets some as evangelists what gift did god give the church Jesus, right? And then Jesus gave these gifts to us. 
right? He gave us apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipment of the saints, the work of service, and the building up of the body of Christ. Now, here's the until. Highlight this. Have the miracle cease? What did he say? Until. That's a time limit, right? Until we all attain to the unity of the faith. He didn't say till we all get unified. We arrive at. Attain means to arrive at. We have a destination. It's unity. We can arrive there. We can get there. We can attain the unity of the faith. And notice how he worded it. Until we attain to the unity. The unity is already there. The unity is out there for us, folks. We can be united if we want to be. Woohoo! And of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children, tossed here and there by the waves and carried out by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. If, if that, I, I mean, I don't know about you. I'm not an architect. I'm not much of a construction man anymore. But that sounds like house building to me. Yeah? You see how every intricate part, every, you, you, did you see that, Nick? You were mentioned in there. Yeah, you were mentioned in there. You have a role in this, right? All of us, all of us were mentioned in there. And so we need to look at it. Are, are we maturing? Because this is what the goal of, of these gifts were doing, that we could mature the infant church, beginning church, when it was just getting started, you know? Because <clears throat> he says in verse 13, until we attain the unity of the faith. What is that talking about? <clears throat> okay. That foundation for us to be able to develop that love that builds the church. <clears throat> okay. You see what he's saying here? Because this, this plays an important part on, on the miracles and, you know, the first century, you know, being different than where we are today. Until, is a time limit, until we what? Attain to the unity of the faith. I mean, has that been done? We, we, we have arrived at where this faith can be unified in. If we're not unified in the faith, we can blame it on God, right? It's his fault. No, he's given us everything we need. Second Peter chapter one, verse three, everything we need, everything pertaining to life and godliness has been given to us. That's amazing. Yes. That there is one body and one spirit. All are called in one hope, one calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father. That's, that's, that's what we've got to establish. We've yeah. got that. We don't need anything else. That's that. That, that was his point, right? We're there. We have that oneness. It's already there for us. We have to attain. We have to arrive at it. It's there waiting for us. We get to arrive at it. And if we ain't there yet, we need to work on that. We need to put some gas in that spiritual automobile and get to going, right? Because, and folks, it's hard. You know, I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not an advocate of false teachers, and I am no way trying to belittle God's truth, but we need to quit all the squabbling among the churches. You know, we, we, we need to understand. We're not perfect, they're not perfect, but we, we're all in Christ, and we need to understand that and not worry about their mistake. That's why God calls the congregations autonomous. We have our own leadership. We have our own guidelines. Now, I know we are all according to the Bible, but not everybody's at that same level, okay? But if we don't stop the squabbling, if we don't stop the bickering and fighting, then the world looks at us like we're just like them, right? We're, we're, just, we're, we're just like another religious organization out there that does an occasional good thing now and then.
Corinthian letter, we'll, we'll get there one day, uh, deals with that. Why are you judging each other, Paul says. We got to judge already. Why are we judging each other? You know, we need to be encouraging and uplifting. If we can throw a teaching out, let's throw it out. But let's not judge. Right. right. They didn't have any right. right. That's the whole idea. That's what Paul's talking to the Ephesians about, guys. Let's not get disunified. Right? Is it unity or untied? You know, we don't want to be untied. We want to be unified. We want to be together. And the way we do that is to understand why God is doing what he's doing and what he's doing in us. You know, you may not like me, but that doesn't mean we can't be one in Christ. You know, and, and I'm not saying that you, you, you can hate me. What I'm saying, you may not like everything I do. You may not like me because I'm a Bronco fan. That's all right. But you love me in Christ. That's okay. I'm all right with that. You can be wrong if you want to be wrong. I'm not going to hold that against you. Yeah, right? Right? And somebody, somebody like us has a lot of them. Right? But we learn to get along. We learn to love each other, even through some of the different things. And, and that's what, what Paul's talking about. Because he says, until we attain the unity of the faith. Now, the, the church started out, the guys uh, were, were inspired. They were out there working miracles. These men would serve their purpose. And as soon as that purpose was done, which Paul's talking about here, those gifts would pass. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 through 13 covers that. And we looked at that. Um, there's always going to be special men on missions, but the apostleship has passed. You know? We, we, we support some missions. I know Gary's got some ideas of mission work that he, that he helps. We do as a, as a congregation, support some mission work, but they're not, they're not apostles. You see, that's been passed. They, they've, been, they've been done away with. There's always going to be speakers with power and passion, but the prophets are done away with. Preachers are not prophets. Yeah. They're Right. There's always need evangelists to go out and do the work. But where does their message come from now? Is it hand delivered? Is it handed down from the same? What is, where does it come from? From God's word. It's not going to change. You ain't going to get up and preach. A, a, oh, the, the Holy Spirit told me to come up and preach to you something different. No, that ain't going to happen. Those days are gone. Right? God speaks to us today. And if, and if Charlie Autry was here, he'd finish that for me. But he's in the sound room. He speaks to us today through Jesus, Hebrews chapter 1. He, he, he doesn't have a direct line, a red phone that we pick up. Hey, God, what do you want for me to do today? Yeah, gotcha. He said, read your Bible. That's what I want you to do today. <laughs> read your Bible, study, and learn and grow. And that's what's going on, okay? So the infant church was to attain this unity in three ways. He wants this church, he wants his church to be unified, folks. And here it is. He gives us those three ways. Look at he says. The unity and of the knowledge of the Son of God, right? Attain the unity of the faith. What is the unity of the faith? How do we attain it if we don't know what it is? How do we arrive at it? Are we still going? We're like the kids in the back seat. Are we there yet? Just a little bit longer, right? How do we arrive at something? What is the unity of the faith? Yeah, you got to study, right? Definitely, definitely so. What is the faith? It's the Word of God, isn't it? It comes from the Word of God, right? It's putting our faith in God's Word. Yeah, it, it, it's simply doing what God asks us to do. Knowing what God wants. Paul uh, talks about it in, in the next chapter when we get there in 2008. D. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the idea of know the will. Don't be a fool. Know what the will of the Lord is. Know what God's will is. How do we know? Well, it's right here. We study it, we learn it, we grow in it. Well, that's your interpretation. And it's not a matter of man's interpretation, right? It's all right there for us. You, you don't have to be a rocket science to be uh, a rocket scientist to be humble. That's the thing. You know? Because not all, everything, not all God's ideas line up with my ideas. I wish he would have called me before he wrote this, but he didn't. Right? Yes? In verse 3, it also says that we have the unity of the Spirit. Yeah. Is there a difference? Well, 
the idea of the unity of the spirit, remember what he says, is preserve that. That's already there. The unity of the spirit's already there. We have to preserve it. We don't make that unity. It's already there. We preserve it by being unified with the spirit, right? Uh, Romans chapter 8 says, blank, 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 these are children of God. What's the blanks? Romans chapter 8, verse 14. The ones being led by the Spirit, these are children of God. You know, if I'm being led by my own desires, my own flesh, my own wants, my, then I'm not a child of God. I, I could call myself that. But what God has very clearly shown is when he pours his Spirit out in, in, within us, that we need to follow that Spirit. What did Paul say? Don't grieve the Spirit. Don't quench the Spirit. Follow the Spirit. Okay? Right, right. And, that, and that's and what he's saying. We have to preserve that. That unity is given to us. That unity of the Spirit is given to us, but we have to preserve that unity, okay? Which means to keep guard, make sure it's taken care of, okay? And we're doing this as we're, as we're reading here, that this is what he wants. Attain, the, arrive at the unity of the faith. But the faith, guys, is simple. God built one church. You believe that? I know every, maybe not everybody on YouTube does, but everybody in this room, I hope, does. There's one church, folks, and I know we, it just kills us to have to say that. Why? Why? We don't say it judgingly. Oh, you think he's the only one's going to heaven. Did I say that? You know? Miss Eileen, did I say that? Did I say well, I think we're the only ones going to heaven? When I said, well, I said, that God built one church. Oh, you think you're the only ones going to heaven? I didn't say that. But God did say there is an only that goes to heaven. Do you know that? What's that? Right? But remember in Matthew chapter 7, what Jesus says, only, here's the only, only those who do the will of my Father will enter into heaven. There is an only in heaven. And it's those who do the will of my Father. What is the church? People that do the will of the Father. And there's only one. There's no divisions. It shouldn't be hard for us to understand that or even to, to preach that to people because we're not talking about a building with a name on it. Although Church of Christ is important because what does God, where does God want Christ to be in our lives? Number one, that includes the name we wear. We're Christians only. We may not be the only Christians, but we are Christians only. And that's, that's, a, that's a quote for, from Campbell. And we're not Campbellites. Campbell uh, didn't, didn't build the church. God did through Christ Jesus. The restoration movement helped America find its way back to the Bible and back to the original worship that God has intended and wrote in the Bible for us to, to be part of. That's what's so great about this country at one time. The, I, I'm, not, I'm not someone that said here we're built on Christian beliefs. No, I didn't say that. But the whole idea of what America was built on was re religious freedom. That's why people came over here. They didn't, want to, they didn't want to be told they had to be part of a church or part of that. They wanted to seek God. What does God want from us? To be seekers. You know? I don't believe something because Mike told me. I believe something because I see it in the Bible. You know? And I don't go over here and I say, well, uh, 1 Corinthians 14, it says that, God gave gifts to everyone. Well, I'm, I'm smart enough to understand I have to take context into, into consideration when I'm reading and when I'm studying and when I'm learning, okay? So it all plays a part. The unity of the faith is that there's one church, one Lord, one Father, one baptism. He already explained what the one faith is. Right up there in, 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 in verse um, 4 through 6. One body, one church, right? One spirit. Only one spirit leading God's church, one hope, one calling. How are we called? Hello. Hey, Nick, what's up? No, wrong number. <laughs> what, how are we called? The gospel. And you know what the calling is? 
Greg, are you willing to die? Are you willing to die? Are you willing to lay your life down, be buried in water, to come in contact with the blood of Christ, let me wash away your sins, be raised to walk in the newness of life, to live a faithful life until death? If you are, you are called, and you have answered your call. One calling. And then, well, 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 you know, God, I appreciate the call, but I don't like the baptism part. Can we do? No, that's not the calling. The calling is, are you humble enough to let me lead you? The gospel. Doesn't make sense to a lot of people. Foolishness to everyone. To the wise. But God makes fools out of the wise by sending this kind of call out. We obey the gospel. And uh, I'm going to share one of my pet peeves. I don't like, I got baptized. You didn't get nothing. You obeyed the gospel, right? We obey the gospel. We die to ourselves. We die to sin. We die to Satan. We're buried with him. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. And then we're raised to walk in the newness of life. We obey the gospel. What did Jesus do? He died. He was buried. He was raised. We obey that pattern. Thanks be to God that you became obedient. We talked about that last week. To that form of teaching. Obeying the gospel. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 says there's two kind of people that's going to face judgment. Do you remember what it was? Do you remember who they are? Those that don't know God. And that's not fair because God's hid himself from some people, right? Uh, wrong answer. God doesn't hide himself. He's revealed himself. They don't know God because they choose not to know God. And they are going to face retribution. But there's a second one. And those who do not obey the gospel. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. Read it. I didn't say it. God did. There's a lot of people that know of God, but don't know him well enough to obey his gospel. And those people are going to feel the wrath of God. And that's a shame. Because they know it's coming. But they got some preacher in the pulpit that's lying to them and said, if they said this prayer, they're saved. You don't have to obey the gospel. Oh, if you want to be baptized, we get enough people, we'll help you because that's very important. But you're already saved. No, no, people, that's not right. That's not the gospel. That is Galatians chapter 1. I'm so amazed that you're deserting him who called you by obeying a different gospel. That's not really even a different gospel, Paul says. But they're distorting the gospel and disturbing you. And you're deserting Christ for another gospel. What a shame. What a shame. Paul's trying to weed that out. Bring this congregation together. Attain the unity of the faith. Folks, there's nothing wrong with the faith. It was once and for all, hear that? Once and for all, handed down to the saints. That's magic. That's beautiful. That God would do that. And we have that same chance to understand and be unified in that same, not a faith, the faith. How many faiths are there? One. One faith. That's the faith that God has given. That's a faith that saves. That's a faith that's talked about in Hebrews chapter 11. And I think that's a vacation faith, isn't it? Abraham went on vacation, didn't he? No. Noah went on vacation, right? Went on a cruise. No. no. He, he did what God asked him to do. That's faith. And God asks us to do great things. And if we're willing, he'll give us the help to do it, and we will be successful because we're unified in that faith. Look what he says. Until we attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Well, we know of Jesus, we're saved, right? We have that unity. No. The word that he uses here is very important. Uh, it's epigenosis. It's a precise and accurate knowledge of the Son of God. And why didn't he just say Jesus? Because it's deeper than that, folks. Our relationship with Christ is deeper than Jesus. It's the Son of God. Why is that? Why, why would you say something like that? Why would you say it's deeper? When we, when we confess Jesus, right, what did we say? Amen. He's the Son of God. What did we just say? 
Well, to the Hebrew idioms, not idiots, but idioms, right? It means that he's equal with God. He is God. Unless you believe that I am he, what's going to happen? You're going to die in your sin. John chapter 6. Unless you believe. Listen to what he said. Unless you believe. Now, we put the word he in there. This is what he said. Unless you have an active faith and understand that I am, you're going to die in your sin. Who's I am? God. Unless you believe that I am God, you're going to die in your sins. Now, there's a whole religious world out there that doesn't believe that Jesus is God. They only believe in God. Doesn't that sound like somebody we read about in the Old Testament? That when Jesus came and introduced himself or who he is, they're like, you ain't the one we're looking for. We don't want you. We're going to, in fact, we're going to kill you. Right? Because you ain't God. The Gnostics, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, well, 1st, 2nd John are written about that idea of their, their teaching. That God can't become flesh. So Jesus wasn't God. So no matter what you do in your flesh, you're all right. As long as your heart, you really want to be like, you want to go to heaven, you're all right. God will take care of you. Because he doesn't, he doesn't hold the flesh against us. See, that's a Gnostic belief. John had to write at least two letters about it. And a lot of the letters that are written in the New Testament are written to um, defend the faith through the Gnostics or over the Gnostics because of their belief. They believed in God. They just didn't believe in Jesus. Well, they're going to heaven then, ain't they? No. No, they're not. You know, we see a, another I am statement. That's right. That's the only way, right? And, and everybody, anybody that doesn't believe in Jesus is not going to attain the unity of the faith and doesn't have a precise and accurate knowledge of the Son of God. That's what Paul's trying to get across, that we have that kind of knowledge. We have that opportunity. We have that chance to know God. So, does God give us everything we need to know these things? 2 Peter 1, 3, right? I give you everything attaining or pertaining to life and godliness. You, I've given you everything through the word of God. Everything. Divine power has made sure that you and I have the ability to attain to this unity, the Son of God. We can know him. And not just know of him, but know him. Okay? Questions? He goes on to say, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ, we, are, we have the opportunity. Are we, may never arrive there, but God doesn't look for perfection, he looks for direction. We're heading there. This is part of heading there. We're heading there today together. We're learning. We're growing in our understanding of who God is, who Jesus is. Yes, Gary? That's right. The body is the fullness of Christ. Well, uh, yeah, and if you ain't in the body, then you don't get anything. You know, you're not getting this, right? Because God adds you to the body. You can leave it if you want, but if you leave it, then you're not understanding what God is trying to help you attain that unity of this faith that God has set forth and handed down to the saints. Faith in God, right? Not faith in man. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just always amazed at, you know, why anybody would go to any man named church. I, I, I don't want to follow a man. You know, I'll follow the son of God. But he was a man, I get it, but he was God. God is a man. Now, I could deal with that, okay? Because that is something miraculous. That is something only God could do. And I'll follow that, okay? So that, that, that's something that's always hit me wrong. So how far will this knowledge take us? This knowledge of the Son of God, how far will that take us? Okay, that, and that's what he says, to the maturity, to a mature level. That word for maturity is teleos, which means what? Perfect, complete, right? We can, we can read it, reach a complete faith 
even to the level of Christ. John 17 that Gary mentioned, the oneness of God in Jesus. We can reach that, folks. Will we? Probably not. But we're trying. It's an opportunity. It's out there. The only reason we don't is because of us. But, you know, it's available. You know, what Jesus did in faith was not a miracle. You know, we sometimes think, oh, well, Jesus was God hanging on a cross. He didn't feel no pain. It was no big deal. No. The prayer in the garden should remind us how serious this was for Jesus. And he did it through faith. Not through miraculous powers, through faith. And I'm telling you, you know, if, if my electric bill's a little bit higher, I go panic. You know, oh no, what am I going to have to do? I'm going to have to miss services and go to work somewhere and make that money. No, 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 no. Jesus didn't panic. He got stressed. I'm not saying he didn't get a little bit, you know, stressed and concerned a little bit, like droplets of blood. I mean, we know it was very, very, but he, well, how did he end, how did he, how did he end all three of his prayers? Not my will, but yours. And whatever you say, God, I'm going to do it. We struggle with Sunday mornings. Yes, Colin? You bet, you bet. It's easy to die for Christ. It's harder to live for him. You know? And that's what we do. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. We live these lives that God's given us as a sacrifice. This is not my life anymore. This is Christ's life. You know? And so I have to make sure that I understand that in relationship to God. So does this mean that we're going to get to a point where we never sin no more? Well, that's immature of you sin, Bunky. Part of the flesh. Goes with the flesh, right? We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Why? Because we're flesh. So we're going to, we're going to have those troubles, but it's becoming a full-grown adult. I don't make the Help me with this, God. I don't make the mistakes I did when I was three. Why are you laughing? I hope I don't. <laughs> Well, you grow up and you mature. You learn that if you put your hand on a hot stove, you won't get burned. That three years old, I didn't know that, right? So, yeah, somebody at me or what? <laughs> well, we learn we, things that we did, you know, in our, in our relationships and everything. We learn as we grow, and that's the idea. We're growing to an adult. The church was a, a, a whole when arriving at a mature state, and they would no longer need the miraculous gifts. When they re got to this point, where God made sure everything was available to us, those miracles stopped. These gifts are, are done away. Okay? Questions about that? That was the goals that, that, that Christ had for the church when he gave those gifts. Kind of like giving me this button that don't work. Huh, Charlie? You playing a joke on me? So um, the idea is growing up in, in the church. Look at verse 14. As a result. So what's going to happen? There's going to be a result. What's a result? Yeah, I did something. This is what happened, right? So as a result, we're no longer to be children. Woohoo! Right? Now, Lane, don't be laughing. He didn't say nothing about height. He said children, right? We're no longer to be children. What's a, what, what, what do you think Paul's talking about? We're no longer to be children. I like being a child. I'm all right with that. <laughs> yeah it's the maturity thing we're not to be childish in our thinking of God in our spiritual walk we grow up right and that's the idea that we are that, that God gave us the growth of each individual member of the body this is what we're talking about Nick this is where we come in this is individual members you notice that when he, when he talked about um, let me find it here We're no longer children, okay? That's plural. But remember, up here, when he talked about a mature man, that's singular. That's individuals. 
We get to be individually growing, but we don't need to be a bunch of kids. This is, this is plural. We, we have ideas that we need to grow up and understand in God. Uh, no longer be children, no longer to be immature, no longer to think uh, elementary prison. You remember Paul talked about, or the Hebrew writer talked about it. You should be teachers, but you're still longing for milk. You're not growing up. That's a problem. Yes. Looking back to my youth and where, we're, where I'm at now, is I learned how important a spiritual, uh, how your faith is important, but then the spiritual family that you get to live on this earth with and share your life with the Christian uh, family. Yes. Yes. And and can the world help me? Get to this mature level? No? Really? It, they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna cause, they're like cup drinking coffee. It's going to stun his growth. Right? And that's, that's going to stun our growth. Right. So who should we be hanging out with? Christians that are going to help us come to this mature level. Because this is God's goal for us. This is what teleos means. God has a goal for us. And when we're growing, we're reaching that goal. Right, Colin? I wanted to add that uh, as one of the younger men in the congregation, I have a duty to grow up and mature in, in Christ so that uh, when, it's, when, when I, I get older, then I can pass down that knowledge and help newer Christians um, attain that, help them attain that maturity. You bet. We, we all got somewhere because, got here because somebody took the time to study with us. Amen. Amen. Right? right. And, and, and we get to a point now that nobody's bringing us that we're bringing ourselves. That's maturing. And we get to the point where nobody could take me away. That's maturing. And we get to the point where we say, even my own family is not going to pull me out of the assembly. We're getting to that maturity. All right? We get to the point where we say, not even my job will take me away. Because that's maturity. You see? And I'm not putting anybody down. I'm not, I'm not criticizing anybody. I'm saying maybe we're not at that mature level yet. I, you know, we all got to get there. We all, I got maturing to do. I know that's a shock, but I do. I need to work on it. I'm asking for your prayers because I want to get to this level. I want to be this person. I have a question. How was the infant church going to know what teaching was true or false how were they going to know they didn't uh, let me let me let me look at it well act 17 they did something right right they looked they looked at the they looked at the scriptures right but in in first corinthians 12 10 it gives a uh, 9 and 10 it gives a list of some of the miraculous things that were being done and a spirit of discernment was part of that uh, uh, miracles that they would be able to, what did John say, test every spirit. They had a way of testing the, the, to see whether these things were so. You know, uh, it, was, it was a gift, part of one of the gifts. But do we have that today? Right, we have the Holy Spirit and we test it through the Word. So yeah, we, we have that same kind of discernment. So with the New Testament in place, the church is made mature, but many individuals are not mature yet. The church is mature. You understand what I'm saying? God's church has reached its goal. But each member needs to keep growing in their understanding and their maturity. So it's available to us to reach it, but we all got to work. We all got to get there. We got to keep studying. We got to keep growing. We got to keep helping each other. And so when Paul spoke of maturity, he used a singular for man, but when he spoke of the members, he used children. Okay, so what are the words to describe how false teachers took advantage of immature Christians that Paul uses right there? What did he say? And we'll look at these individually, uh, but I keep hearing this bell in my ear. Okay, we got a two up there. Two for what? I'm number two. That was the second bell? Oh, my goodness. Then we won't get into this this morning. We will save that for next week. That's cliffhanger, right? Hopefully you'll come back.
Let's close with a prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we bow before your almighty throne. We're so grateful today to be here, um, to be amongst your children, people that are seeking and growing in their understanding of you. And Father, we thank you for Paul's letter to the Ephesians that helps us to uh, attain the unity of the faith. Father, we're grateful for that unity that you've given uh, us a chance to be part of, a unity that makes us one with you. Father, we ask that you be with us through our life and help us to do things that will bring glory to your name. We ask that you be with the sick people around us. We know that there, there are some ailing um, with COVID and all the other things that are going on. We pray that your healing hand will be upon them and that they can rest upon your shoulder of strength, mercy, and grace. Father, be with us in our worship today. Strengthen us and help us to stay focused. Help us to glorify you. And Father, we're so grateful for our young uh, men that will be leading our worship tonight. Be with them and help them to have a, a good recollection, recollection of the things that they've studied and help them to do great tonight to give us your word. Thank you, Father, for your blessings. Thank you for sending Jesus. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all.